Okay, welcome to the 44th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Amelia White. Amelia is a humanistic counsellor who works in private practice in Hove and online. She tutors on the Person-Centred Foundation degree course at East Sussex uh, College. She has a specialism in working with those struggling as a result of their boarding school experience and offers individual therapy to those affected by their own or partner's schooling. She facilitates groups, runs workshops and courses. Welcome, Amelia. Thank you, Piers. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the segues I, I like to do in the podcast is to say where I met people. And I think of all the people who've been on the podcast, this is probably the most interesting because I met you as an 11 year old. <laughs> and I was just trying to think like if I can actually have a memory of, but I'm not sure I do. No. But I can picture you. I can picture you very clearly yeah. as an 11 year old. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Me, me too. I can't remember what class we were in together, but I'm sure we were in some class together and it was like, and I remember liking you, but as we all share, I was very, very shy as a yeah. as a boy. So it's like, don't talk to the girls. Don't you have talk blonde to the girls. hair. You were very blonde. I think were you blonde? I yeah. was thinking you was being blonde. I was quite blonde, but I did go to Australia when I was mm -hmm. um, in my spring, like the Easter holiday, and I okay. dyed it. I stuck lemon juice in my hair, so it, it went right white. Okay. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, so for those, so basically we went to the same boarding school as each other. It was a co-educational boarding school. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a, probably a year or two ago, someone who was on the year above me said, oh, they kind of, I think they'd seen my website and reached out to you. Yes. So they sent me a copy of your website or something I was like oh have you seen Piers Cross is working in the same field you are um <laughs> so googled you and found you and yeah and reached out mm -hmm. and then came another coffee in Hebden Bridge didn't we um, That's it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah it was lovely to reconnect again yeah yeah mm -hmm. so it feels like yeah it's really because there's interesting there's someone else from our school who lives in Hebden Bridge so mm -hmm. it was around that time I came across her um so it's like yeah. oh, all these these interesting avenues kind of yeah. opening up so I guess one of the things I would love for you to share mm -hmm. which I like to 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 ask my guests is to share some of your journey how have mm -hmm. you got into the work you're now doing especially with ex-boarders or yeah. with trauma okay well well as you've just said there's a background in going to boarding school but um I started training as a counsellor about 12 years ago and it was a case of I was helping out actually on a workshop um, led by Joy Shaverin mm -hmm. who came in to speak about her book that she had just published um, and it was one of those light bulb moments where everything that she spoke about was tick 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 um and I was also there with a friend um that I went to school with that we went to school with um and one of the main things that came out is she actually spoke about um abuse and she spoke about the kind of normalization of it within schools mm -hmm. and myself and my friend at that point we just turned to each other and we went it did all happen didn't it mm -hmm. that was all real it was all going on and um and it was a real moment of kind of recognition and then kind of thinking, OK, I'm going to look into this a bit further. Um, but actually, in a way, it wasn't my own marriage then kind of broke up a few years later. And I think it was then that I started. I started to see a male psychoanalyst, um, which was interesting and really started to look at my attachment patterns and started to look at my issues with male authority um, and started to then really be able to kind of bring in the boarding school stuff and start to understand how some of it had impacted me, especially in relationship. Um, 
so that were and actually then at the same time it was actually when everything came out in the press about our school so it was just coming at me from all angles it was like actually you can't ignore this any longer um so that all happened and then I think it was only just a few years ago maybe that I first actually it was the it was trauma abandonment and privilege it was the book by Thurston and Nick that really hit home for me um and I just remember devouring it and thinking okay I get it now I really get it and it really helped me to understand my ways of being in relationship and realize that I'm not weird (laughs) but actually there's a reason why I am the way that I am and um and that's I think what has pushed me into this there's been times I thought okay no you don't need to go into that area but I'm just drawn back um and a lot of my passion is really about trying to help others to recognize the kind of the deep impacts so there might be people saying oh yeah but I wasn't abused I wasn't really badly bullied I wasn't this or that it didn't affect me um and it's about the everyday child who is actually left on their own to fend for themselves at a really young age Mm -hmm. that is the trauma that is the impact um you don't have to have been abused you don't have to for boarding school to have had such a lasting impact um and that's i think my message what i want to share with people Mm -hmm. thank you thank you yeah wow yeah i kind of knew bits of your journey it's useful to hear so thank you amelia Mm -hmm. So partly our conversation today, we when we spoke originally, it was like the idea of co-educational boarding school. Yeah. How they are, you know, a lot of, say, Nick's work or Joy's work is single sex schools. Yeah. This idea that, you know, I've heard in the press this idea that, well, a, a, a co-educational boarding school is is easy or it's much easier than those other places. So I guess... I would love for you to begin it with mm. what your experience was at, mm. at boarding school as a girl. And then maybe afterwards, I'll share a little bit about what it was like as a boy there. Mm. Um, but I think it'd be really useful to hear, mm. especially that the patriarchal side. What was it like being yeah. a girl in a... Well, I suppose fundamentally at our school, it wasn't equal, was it? So when we went, it was there was actually only 200 girls and 800 boys. Yeah. so it was a boys school yeah. um and that was what I was brought up in so in a way I was thinking about it it's like you had friends who were boys um but still in your own little boarding house it was very much like being kind of single sexed in that sense mm-hmm. um that there was the same stuff that I've heard that kind of goes on in other single sex kind of boarding schools um so just that sense of just being on your own from such a young age um was very basic you know we had dormitories 30 raw iron beds in a row horsehair mattresses um I often hear people saying oh but it's different with girls isn't it because they're much more caring they're much more nourishing they're much kinder to one another It's just not the case. It's absolutely (laughs) not the case. Um, So the same, people are often surprised. I often hear there's an illusion that, oh, yeah, but there was, there's not fagging with girls. There's not that kind of thing. There was for us in our school. You know, the hierarchies, the privileges, kind of what we had to do for the older girls, whether it's like making them toast or kind of, you know, there were so many things. And if you didn't, you know, you'd be punished by the older girls. Um, so that was all really kind of prevalent um, in that place. But something that I think for me is really important, I don't feel it's spoken enough about, um, is actually what's it like growing up in an institution surrounded by a ring fence with boys when there's no parenting. Yeah. So there's no safeguarding. There's no role modelling. So we're all just experimenting with each other from the age of 11 Mm. and there's no one to look out for you. Mm. And that is really dangerous. Um, Mm. And that's had an impact. Um, So I feel my heart 
beating. Um, but I don't know if you remember this, but there, there used to be, um, what it's really doing. They used to, do you remember the term fruit bat? Yeah, yeah, interesting. So 18 year old boys used to choose a girl on the second form, 11 year olds, and they would be their fruit bat and they'd come round at break and they would give them a box of matchmakers or something. Um, and they may have to sit on their lap. And as a girl, it was like, oh, it's a privilege to be chosen, to be special. Um, yeah. But it's things like that, that there's no looking over. Whereas it's like, I have uh, daughters. Mm -hmm. So if my daughter was 11 and an 18 year old boy came knocking on my door and was like, I'm just gonna come and hang out with your 11 year old. And it's like, that would not be okay. Um, so it's just kind of one example mm -hmm. of those situations that actually just left people really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of sexuality side developing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I don't see as being that different today than it was 40 years ago. Um, that that's an element of, yeah, boys and girls growing up together with no parenting, no one to turn to, no one to talk to about all this stuff. You know, we learn from each other. Yeah, yeah children it's like yeah children in you know as we get older adults body but bodies but that's kind of my mm. reflection is we had one house master or one tutor on duty for 50 or boys or girls at any one time yeah and therefore who do we who did we learn from yeah it's and you're just told man. yeah by others like, do you remember the house dances? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there'd be, like, spin the bottle or various things. Um, I don't think I was invited to a lot of the female house dances, though, for some reason. Some of like, I must have been, because you have some photos. Of I've got me. a photo of you at our house very, dance, actually. Yeah. Very vulnerable. I look like I'm yeah. about to burst into tears. Yeah, yeah, I think you've got the choice to choose one boy each or something. Um, yeah. So what that, how that is set up, um, yet the contrast, what I also remember is the fact that at the boys' house dances, they still used to bring in girls from other schools. Mm -hmm. um, am I allowed to swear? Um, Please do. Which were known as the fuck trucks. Mm -hmm. So I was a girl in a co-ed boarding school who would witness girls being brought in from other schools and delivered to the boys' houses, affectionately known as fuck trucks. So what impact has that had on me growing up as a woman mm. and my perception of girls? Um, so mm. There's so many different kind of ways that have kind of imprinted me um, growing up as a girl mm. in predominantly a boys' school. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. See, and mm. I think this is an interesting thing to maybe speak of is that I wasn't aware of these things because of the communication. I didn't yeah. really speak to girls. It was almost like those first few years for me. And I was working mm. this out before we came on the call is because of the timetabling and we weren't really allowed out of house very much. Those first few, yeah. years, I didn't really, and I was deeply shy mm. And therefore, in class, I didn't dare speak, let alone speak to a girl. So mm. I have no idea these types of things went on. Okay. Yeah. You know, like the fruit bat, we did have that thing, we, we, but it was mm. more of a, a boy on our year, and it was the older boys. Okay. Show their affection to the fruit bat. Right, the younger boy. The mm. younger boy, um, and give his affection. But I hadn't heard about that in the girl with the girls, but it kind of makes sense because you were, whereas we had senior and junior houses, mm -hmm. you had all girls in what is that correct? Yeah. All yeah. from yeah. 11 to 18. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore the 18-year-old girls would bring in the 18-year-old boys mm. and we'd all be sitting around, yeah, together in that day room as such. Um, um so yeah, you're quite left quite vulnerable, actually, yeah, yeah. a lot of the time. So there was a lot that kind of went on in those kind of places. Um, mm. 
so yeah there are a lot i think that's a real negative mm -hmm. of that um and that's where i feel people today can go oh yeah but the boarding school's fine because it's co-ed so they learn about the other gender you know in comparison to single sex schools um but how are they taught now how where is the kind of the role modeling um mm -hmm. in that place you're just left to your own devices to fumble around um with one another um yeah and i don't feel that's changed particularly yeah and that was one of the questions i had which was co-educational boarding schools a lot of these male boarding schools have become mm -hmm. co-educational yeah in your work with people have you noticed that it's changed over the years that now you know they are better mm -hmm. places or they don't have the same issues that we had well i've because I thought we would talk about this, I've just been talking recently to a colleague who works um, in a co-ed school, and her answer is no. Um, so, she, so the pastoral care is better, mm -hmm. um, but the similar issues with regards to girls and boys kind of being left alone and kind of experimenting together um, is very much there. And also that element of um because these institutions are based on patriarchal values mm. um so girls grow up um feeling like they can't show their emotions they have to be resilient they have to be independent they have to have high endurance you know the same things that you grew up with we mm. grew up with exactly the same mm. um but what is a legacy of that, and it was a massive legacy for me, is the, is the inner misogyny. Mm. So I turned against other women. Mm. Um, and it took me really until I was uh, 40, so about seven years ago, when I started to go, OK, I'm going to embrace my own femininity. Mm. Um, it was alien to me, absolutely alien to me. Um, and I remember doing a counselling training once years ago, and we were talking about our prejudices and you know that whether it's homophobia or racism or various things and I remember saying the one thing that I have a real issue with is women who take care of their appearance who wear makeup who go and get their nails done um and I really believe a lot of that came from growing up in a male kind of boarding school um those values that just get passed down because there's no way for women to express that. There's no nurturing of it. There's no kind of feminine role models to kind of say, actually, these are really great values. Um, actually, it's, it's you know, we, I mean, I've got teenage daughters and they have taught me so much, um, so much, but it's been really hard because I've had to grow up. That part of me has grown up alongside them. So to begin with, when they're kind of 11 and they're starting to put on makeup, I'm like, what are you doing? Um, like really kind of like, I had to be quite hard to not shame them for it mm. because that was how I felt. Um, and I've learned that actually it's wonderful for them to embrace this part of themselves. Mm. Um, but I feel that is a legacy for girls growing up in boarding schools. Um, and that aspect of that co-ed and this colleague that I was talking to recently, it really came up the sense of actually that some of the girls still feel like they are in a boys boarding school yeah. rather than it's a girls boarding school with boys in it or that it's equal. Um, and something to look at was also, we were talking about um, the leadership team, mm -hmm. that actually if you look at who is, in charge of the school um the majority of the team leaders the headmaster the deputy are men yeah. and i'll be quite interested to see in all the co-ed schools what that's like mm -hmm. so actually how much kind of a female values are kind of passed down to these girls in these co-ed boarding schools mm -hmm. um, or are they predominantly male yeah um, yeah that's a great question and I don't know, I've spoken to a couple of head teachers, one mm -hmm. retired, um, 
one he worked in a boarding school but now he's um gone on to a, a mainstream school um mm. and yeah he they're both men so i haven't had much mm. experience of speaking to or knowing who's on the leadership team so yeah like you know fascinating question um so i guess one of the things I mean, you you kind of answered it a little bit, but I guess my third question was, in your work with exporters, have you noticed different hang-ups or different issues that have surfaced between people who've been to single-sex schools and co-educational schools? Okay. And if so, what are they? Um, I would say... Predominantly the answer is no. <laughs> because the trauma is the same mm. whatever school you go to yeah. so the root of the trauma is being sent away from home at a young age mm. is about abandonment is about having to fend from yourself from a really young age you know whether you're five or seven or 11 regardless of kind of what genders are around you the same situation is there that you're alone on that first night as many children are this week. Um, and that element of, you know, they've got to shut down their emotions and they've got to learn how to be okay. And they've got to not show their tears and not feel homesick and be busied out of it. And that is there regardless of, you know, the people around you. Um, so that issue is generally there for everybody. Um, so, you know, an additional, issue is obviously how we relate in relationship to the opposite sex when we're older when we come out um and i suppose my experience of people who've been to co-ed there's more um though you may actually have different answers to me because <laughs> um, <laughs> i was going to say there's more kind of feeling more comfortable with uh the opposite sex um i know that i have always been much more comfortable with the opposite sex um as friends mm. uh but not necessarily in intimate romantic relationships um but there's we grow up you know i grew up with you as a sibling i grew up with boys as siblings as friends um so they're not so alien for someone who has been to a single sex school mm. um but the element of intimacy and attachment and how to be in relationship with someone when they're older, I don't think is hugely different mm. in that place. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so maybe my experience, because I was very shy, I don't think I really, I think I had a, a girlfriend on after my hair went blonde on my <laughs> Easter term, the summer term, I think I was quite popular because I was in the cricket team and uh, yeah. and I had a girlfriend for a week, but I don't think <laughs> who was on my year. I don't think we spoke much and I can't remember what happened. Um, mm. But after that, that was my last girlfriend till I was basically my second second to last year at school my last term so yeah. I didn't have any connection with really girls even friends wise mm. so what I found after I left school is I was really poor with women until I learned to be nasty to them okay so I it, it was well as in that they weren't attracted to you until you were nasty to them yeah just you know kind of not interested in me so as an 18 19 year old traveling girls weren't interested so i wow. what i did is i started to be nasty and you know not violent but just kind of ignoring them or not talking to them i kind yeah. of put on this persona of the bad boy and again as ex-boarders i think we can see that with so many well-known actors is that we're good at acting so i put on this persona of being the bad boy yeah. and and that got me some it girls worked. it worked for a little while until my girlfriend was yeah. like oh no no i don't like that 
I'm going to go. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll try and soften a bit. Um, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, the beginning, I I did really struggle mm-hmm. with, with girls. Um, but I suppose what I'm hearing is that, again, because there's no role modelling, there's no guidance. So mm-hmm. even if there are girls in your kind of schooling environment, mm-hmm. there's still no idea on actually how to relate to girls. Mm-hmm. That actually that absence of those parents, those absences of those uncles, those aunts, those people mm-hmm. in the community around you aren't there. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. So actually, it still has an impact, even if there are other girls in the school, on yeah. knowing how to be, how to relate. Yeah. yeah. And and I don't know if you did this with the boys, but for me, I deified the girls. I used to sit in chapel, especially if the mm. girls were opposite, and yeah. I would think, oh, they're looking at me, you know, and I would deify, and it would give me mm. a lovely feeling on one level. Mm. But I'd never dare talk to them if I liked mm. someone, you know. I, I, in all those eight years, seven years I was there, even when I really liked them, I never told them. Yeah. yeah actually, just hearing that, it makes me feel um, quite sad. I, I think that element of all children being so deprived of love and affection, so what just gets projected onto the other? And that scene, I can see so clearly, it was like each term they changed and they were well, your position in chapel. Yeah, yeah. And I remember we'd get excited if it's like, oh, it's that boarding house. Oh, you know, that was the excitement. Um, but actually how much attention was given on to trying to get that glaze, that look from another, that attachment to a boy um, was everything. And I know that is for lots of children as a teenager, you know, your hormones are going, that is everything. Um, but children are so depleted of affection from anywhere else. Yeah. So again, it leaves you more vulnerable. Um, it's like, will anyone have me? Um, yeah. And then actually for us at our school, you know, there weren't that many choice of girls in that sense for you. Um, but choice, it feels like I'm kind of, it's like, like picking yeah. <laughs> the girls to, um, yeah, to have, to meet those needs. Yeah. So there's something that's quite objectifying also. Yeah, about it for one another, and that's almost oh. like I hear from say Nick or Joy's work this objectifying. I women became objects of girls became objects yeah. of desire of like you say that attachment. I wasn't getting the love from mum or dad yeah. or si- yeah. my sister or my dog. So it's yeah. like, oh my god, you yeah. know, oh, I yeah. got to have this person, but I. I you know, it's like the catch twenty two. But I, I, mm. be, I think I remember mm. one time, I plucked up the courage one Sunday. Someone says, "Go and speak to us." I went over to one of the girls' houses, and I was like, "Hello," and I didn't see anything else. It's like, and then I'd walk out again, <laughs> right? Because the boy yeah, walking to the girls' house that. got twenty girls' eye pairs of eyes looking at you. Yeah, and you had to be invited, and you had to be signed in. All those kind of things. Oh, I forgot. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What it meant. Whereas for me, I knew that my way in was to become everyone's friend. Mm. Um, mm. So I became the best friend to all the boys. That was my, I became the shoulder for them to cry on, basically. It was kind of my way um, because it then felt that actually they wouldn't leave me. So as long as I remained best friends with all the boys, then I wasn't going to get left. Um, and that was a pattern that I continued for years and years and years um, to be the boy's best friend, but not actually get in a relationship with them. Yeah. So I never had to risk being left. Um, and that definitely, that was my part of my survival personality as such at school, mm. um, was to be everyone's friend in that place. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, the strategic survival personality that Nick talks about. Yeah, yeah how he managed it. Yeah. 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 So that perception, and maybe that's quite interesting. So that sense of how I maybe saw you was just the really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were the nice, sweet boy. Um so it meant that no one's going to turn against you or be nasty because you were just really nice. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Interesting. And and I think that's maybe something it's like the shadow. I became I was very hard on myself, as I've shared other times in the podcast. Mm-hmm. Really hated myself every now and again, especially when I drank alcohol. That nice that, that anger would bubble up. Mm-hmm. And you, you might not realize, but I punched a few people and headbutted a few people. Well, at school, yeah, 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 yeah. One person oh. twice, actually, because uh, someone who, who was yeah. bullying me in class kind of having a yeah. go. So I went up and said hello to him one night. I'd had some gin and he just went piss off. And so I headbutted him. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, what have I done? So I went walking around the school. Oh no, terrible. And I came back to the dance and I saw him there and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he went piss off. So I punched him. <laughs> wow. So that rage was there, basically. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. nice so persona. I kind yeah. of, and I felt that, that kind of that, that angry part of me and I kind of channeled it into sport and I see and I wonder although it's not quite a fix by channeling it into sport because you might be really aggressive on the sports field but then after my anger would still be there it didn't really uh, dissipate Um, yeah and I think around girls I was you know nice I gotta be nice uh, mm. and yeah yes and i think that's been one of my wounds to heal is letting go of being nice and just learning to be me as an accepting all parts of you yeah 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 so mm. uh, one of the things i would i mean we've kind of talked about how actually the wound of attachment you know mm. ties the co-education on single sex are there any other things that you've noticed in people you've worked with that actually it's across the board that we struggle with? I know Nick talks about certain things, but what about in your work that, you know, actually it's just a boarding school thing that w- these are the struggles that consistently show up? Because uh, I think trust, trust. The first thing that comes to mind for me, yeah. trusting one another. Um, so I run groups actually, and I've been I've run an online course um, which we've done twice, and it's really uh, it's really daunting for people to come on mm. because it's that setting. It's like, well, I'm going to be in a group with peers, not you, with <laughs> other peers, um, and I don't trust anyone, um, mm. and. That is that is a theme that comes over over and over again, um, and I think it really comes, you know, deep down. It's that sense of if your parents, however much the rational part of you, may be able to say, it's because my parents were in the forces. It's because they thought it was the best thing for me. It was because they gave me this wonderful education. That child still feels like they have been abandoned by their parents. Mm. Um, and therefore if your parent has left you how can you trust that somebody else isn't going to leave you how do you trust that your husband wife whoever is not going to leave you um because it goes against nature there's something that goes against biology that aspect of but a mother's supposed to keep their child with them Mm. um Mm. and then you're put in this setting and quite instantly you have to let go of that attachment let go of that safety and make a conscious choice to attach to your peer group Mm. because that's the way that you're going to survive so what do I do so hence us talking about that you know way of being whether it's being the nice person or the friendly person or the so it's kind of like right I've got to do that I've got to find a way to feel safe but you're in a dormitory of 30 people, however, not however many people. There's a hypervigilance, isn't there? That's always there. Mm-hmm. Like you witness, it may not be you, but you witness someone else's boards being set on their bed or being bullied or being kicked or abused. How do I make sure that that's not going to happen to me? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I see that comes into 
I want to say <laughs> I want to say every person that I work with, but that feels too pathologizing. But a real lack of safety about being with others. Um, and that theme of like there's a desperation to want to connect and want to be intimate and want to be close and an utter terror of it at the same time. Mm. And that kind of going between those two places. Um, yeah, is the struggle that I really see. That's I've heard numerous times, but I know that I'm safe on my own. Mm. I know that actually if I'm on my own, I don't have to worry. Yet I get lonely and I feel really alone. So I want to be in a relationship, but then that's really scary. So I retreat. So it's that forward, backwards. Um, so I think that's one of the main things that I see, mm -hmm. regardless of whatever gender you are, mm -hmm. um, that is prevalent from all boarding school experiences. Mm -hmm. How about you? Do you relate to that one? Do you see that yourself? Yeah, I think I struggle to trust. I mean certainly it took me many years to trust and i think uh, one of my beliefs it's like it was almost like i i realized i set up a set of rules or beliefs it was like almost a rule book i was writing it was like i would share you know in that first year i would share my secrets with someone on my dormitory and then i would hear everyone talking about it i'm like Rule number one, do not share your vulnerability with anybody. Then I might show an emotion. I think I cried um, one time after about three or four weeks and it, all of the dormitory came in because we didn't have doors yeah. um, into my cubicle and they were laughing and shouting at me. And, and that was rule number two. Don't show <laughs> any vulnerability, any emotion you know, and whatever means necessary. So I think for me, the, the common thing that I see with people, I think is, is that inner critic is virulent. It's, it's horrible, you know, how hard we are on ourselves. And I'd say that's combined with the perfectionist. Yeah. And therefore in relationship, a relationship's not meant to be perfect. And yet we do everything we can to make it perfect while also having one foot out going, yeah. uh, right, if it gets difficult, I'm going to go. I'm going to run. Yeah. Shame also is just coming up for me. I think shame is uh, something that a lot of people carry um, about having any of those feelings, any of those emotions, any of those vulnerable feelings, yeah. any needs whatsoever. Um, so I think a really a trait that I see is so prevalent is about having to do everything for yourself, having to be independent, having to manage everything on your own, never asking anyone for help whatsoever. And the shame that comes up about doing so um, just even. And it's something that I've really had to work on with myself to um just having this flashback that there was a time I was cycling down the seafront um I live in Brighton and I was with my partner and it was really cold and he was like well take my gloves um and it was quite a new relationship and I remember just thinking I can't take your gloves I felt so much shame about accepting the offer of a pair of warm gloves um and my head was thinking, he's going to think you're really weird. You're really kind <laughs> for not doing this. But I couldn't do it. I found it so hard to receive from somebody else um, this kind of belief. No, no, I'm fine. I don't need comfort. I'm absolutely fine. I don't need anything. I can manage on my own. And those kind of patterns are things that I've started to be able to change in myself because I recognize it. I know that that comes from fending for myself from such a young age and believing that I didn't need to be taken care of by anybody else um and now going yeah you do actually <laughs> you really want that you really want to feel cared for so I will take your gloves even though it feels really hard to do so um so changing that pattern but that's definitely something I notice in people mm -hmm. um, and that's the burnout the exhaustion because you end up doing everything on your own all the time yeah um, and that, again, it goes across all genders. You know, it's not a male thing. Mm. For women, single-sex schools, co-ed schools, it's exactly the same. 
So that's why I say those same kind of values that kind of kind of cross go across all these schools. Um, mm. And that's there in 2022 as it was in 1970. You know, children kind of growing up far too young on their own. Yeah, yeah. And I can definitely relate to that. I remember in my 20s, one, I had a breakdown um, physically that I was just working because so i got to live this in this monastery this buddhist monastery and it was wonderful and it was beautiful you know like lovely people it felt very relaxing on one level but i couldn't stop working this always doing uh, yeah and i couldn't ask for help and eventually i just couldn't mm. get out of bed one day because i didn't have any time off because i was in yeah. the monastery yeah and yeah, the abbot used to say to me, he said, Piers, you know, you're really lovely. Be oh, no, I'm not. Stop being nice to me. And this went on for a few yeah. months, and he just said, eventually, I'm not going to praise you anymore, Piers, because, you know, you just can't receive it. And receive I'd get it. really yeah. angry at him. It's like, it's not true. I'm a piece yeah. of shit. You know, it was one of my sayings was, I'm a piece of shit. And that was what I used to tell myself. Um at a, at a young age so i can really yeah. resonate with that receiving it's like oh you know um, yeah. yeah so yeah yeah thank you yeah so i can yeah. resonate with the trusting mm. um the shame yeah the shame about just being being ourselves and i hear that with with clients and and people and, and receiving because i think part of being in relationship is giving and receiving um, yeah. and especially from a male's perspective because i work with mainly men is this importance of giving in relationship but it's like we we really struggle as exporters to give okay it's like uh, as in you mean to give in your relationship yeah you mean, emotionally emotionally or or any time right. you know we work okay. oh i'm providing but to actually give right. presence to mm -hmm. listen to give yeah. of our love okay. it's like yeah that's one of the things i see mm -hmm. certainly men is that inability to give we've almost disappeared inside ourselves that i don't need anything from you and therefore you should need nothing from me right Withdraw. you should be sorting yourself out right so that expectation of your partner to do that that they should therefore yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and i think where that can also cause quite a legacy is for people when they have children because mm -hmm. that can therefore be put onto their children and i often work with people who say i know that actually i don't want to be getting to be expecting my seven year old to be sitting up and doing three hours of prep every night, but there's part of me that does, and I think that there's something wrong with them because they're not doing that, um, yeah. and really just like really struggling with that um, that aspect of that um, that sense of your child falls over. It's like well they should just be getting up and getting on with it um, mm. because there was no one there to put a plaster on my knee. Um, so those expectations, then the projections get passed on to their own children, that they should be more grown up than they are at, this, at a young age. Mm -hmm. So how do you find, say if someone is in your groups who struggles with trusting, how do you start to go, it's okay, you can? Because again, there's part of our brain which is like, oh, I know I can trust. There's another mm -hmm. part that's going no way so how do you address yeah. that amelia um i think it is about vulnerability mm. um so i suppose my stance i'm quite i think i work quite differently as an individual therapist to how i am in my groups mm. so this is who you get um so i don't hide any aspect of myself but i show my own vulnerability within groups or share some of my own experiences or learnings or history and I think that innate well this is what I've heard is the feedback that that enables others to feel actually that they can share part of themselves too because it is role modeling mm. so mm. again it's that aspect of what many children miss out on 
at boarding school um just hearing you talking about you know being a man and not obviously having that man that father who was there emotionally expressing himself you know doing it differently um so I suppose there's an element of me taking the risk of sharing myself and then realizing oh the world's not falling apart is it actually it draws people towards you rather than away from you um but everyone moves at different rates. Everyone moves at different times and they to be able to do that. Um, but I think it is, it's incredibly healing to come together as a group and start sharing um, mm. and realizing that it's okay. Yeah. And to, to not feel like you have to, I think that's a really important part of it also mm. to try listening to your body, so listening to like what it feels like for you to be able to do so. Mm. Um, Cause it is really hard when you've kind of yeah there's a because it's a you know your nervous system is going your heart can be beating um soothing yourself reassuring yourself that you're okay so for me when I joined groups um so I did the psychotherapy training with Nick Duffel a few years ago mm -hmm. and I remember when I first joined that group I hated everybody <laughs> so it was it was in it was still um during covid and so the first time we met was all on zoom and i sat there and i was like don't like you don't like you don't like you you're all different to me because you all went to boarding school i went to a different type of school um so i'm not like you um and decided i didn't want to be part of it i didn't like anyone um and i thought how am i going to manage this and then they they all said oh let's create a whatsapp group and i was thinking there's no way i want to be in your whatsapp group um and then we all met in person and I named it. So we sat in this group and I said, I just have to say that I feel really uncomfortable in groups. Um, this is my process. This is what's going on. And once I'd named it, it just went, um, it just disappeared. So sometimes for me, it's like actually just being able to name it and go, I'm really scared about being in this group mm. and then being heard and that being met is enough for it to kind of fall away um and I suppose that's what I maybe encourage others to do just to share oh yes it's really scary isn't it it's really frightening not knowing if we're going to be judged or how others are going to see us um it is really frightening however you are now 40 as opposed to seven and so it's bringing in you know your adult self to be able to reassure your younger self to be able to say you're going to be okay you're going to be okay that it's not as frightening the feeling might be coming from your inner seven 11 year old but actually as an adult you're going to be okay mm. and I think that can really help yeah 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 thank you thank you just that vulnerability that speaking up mm. yeah yeah mm. Yeah, it's interesting. As you were sharing earlier, it's like fear, that scaredness. So I realized that was one of my overriding feelings at school was mm -hmm. although as I got older, I was you know, good at sport and I didn't receive mm -hmm. the bullying. I was always in fear most of the time because I was worried of messing up or mm -hmm. not being good enough. And that's almost how I was kind of run through fear yeah and therefore me going into a group at the beginning or challenging that mm. you know, this was about 2002 it was like petrifying the inner voice going you idiot what are you doing I was, yeah, yeah. That's an, it's not safe it's not safe put the defenses yeah. back up mm -hmm. uh, um, so i can really resonate mm -hmm. with that that idea of that feeling scared and fear but it's a trauma response also it's that kind of the fight or flight system gets ignited so now it's like i need to run um in this moment mm. and i think that's where all this awareness comes when people start to look at this stuff and understand actually you know maybe you may not remember it because lots of people don't remember that first night in boarding school or those feelings but actually if you picture a 7 11 year old that first night in a dormitory full of complete strangers, mm -hmm. it's hard to think that someone's not gonna feel at all scared or worried. Um, 
they've lost all their home comforts, everything that was around them. Um, and so no wonder they will feel scared. Mm -hmm. But there was no one there to soothe them. So there was no one there to put their arm around them and tell them that it was going to be okay. So those feelings just got pushed down and they ignite. Age 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, when you then enter another group environment and you can feel those same feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's what doing this work is and the therapy work is, is processing that, understanding it. So when I have situations where I can feel those feelings now, I'm able to say, no wonder. You know, no wonder you feel this way because actually that's what happened. Um, but you're okay now. Yeah. So it's bringing in that part that can help soothe you so you can stay in those situations mm. but they're not quite so frightening any longer. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you. So if, if there's somebody who's, you know, been to boarding school mm. and maybe this is the first conversation they've heard, what would you suggest to them? Um, I know that wasn't on my questions to you, but I'm just... no, no, no. It's not that. It just I think it makes I think it's just the cons I think what it made why it made me sigh is it's just that I don't know the consideration. I think it's so enormous when someone first comes across this if they haven't come across it. Mm. Um, mm. And so it was just you kind of suggesting that, that someone may see this for the first time and be wondering about this part of themselves um, because it is eye opening. Um, and it's really worth exploring um, and finding out more about it. I think one of the dangers is that people can pathologize a lot. I think that people, there's a danger I see and it's like, well, this is the whole reason I am the way that I am. Mm. Um, and I've just, I've noticed that actually more recently with some partners, it's kind of like, that I'll often get the partner sent by the husband or wife for therapy because they've come across boarding school syndrome and thought, okay, go and get yourself fixed. That's the reason why you are the way that you are. But actually every individual is more complex than that. There's so many different reasons and life experiences that make everybody up. But it's a part of you that's worth exploring. Um, and yeah, a huge start is with the books. Um, mm. So there's... As you know, Nick Duffel's making, what's it called? Making events. <laughs> making events. Um, yeah, his books. Um, for women, um, Coming Home, I think it's called, mm -hmm. is a wonderful book. And it's something I've recommended on some of my courses. And some of the women have found that so, um, yeah, just huge, actually. Because it's hearing other people's stories. Mm. um and that's and again i'm just thinking of the groups that i run that's that is the thing that they find the most helpful is that sense of this isn't just me um yeah it's like i'm not alone with this we're so similar and there's a reason for that um so yeah it's just exploring this stuff so yeah starting with the books find if you need to if you want to go deeper finding a therapist finding someone who works who has knowledge of boarding school syndrome, because a lot of people don't. Um, and I think that is so important, so important. I've done training for therapists and I've been shocked by actually the prejudices that have come out mm. in that. So people still understandably, our society, it's the huge propaganda, you know, that it's a privilege. And so if therapists haven't looked at this, they may think that too. So that's a really important part to find someone who is kind of trained in this area or has an understanding of it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, just exploring it in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So reading books and no. looking for a therapist who's informed in this area. And I'm, Absolutely. I'm you run groups as well. Yeah. So I run an online group. Um, I have one starting November, actually, it's an eight-week um, course. And it kind of starts looking, it, we kind of go from the beginning. So your first day at school, and then it, there are different themes each week uh, that we explore, such as going through puberty in school, um, intimacy and relationships, taking care of yourself. Those kind of themes that I think are really um, important and prevalent for people to do. 
um, so things like that. I even have a, um, I'm quite a advocate of um, nature and wild swimming. Yeah. So mm. actually at the beginning of October, I have a day in, um, it's called NEP Wildlife Wilding Estate in West Sussex. Okay. Come across that, we're quite far away from you. Yeah. Um, um, and so I'm doing an afternoon there where it's actually it's for people to just come together and meet one another and they can take a dip in a pond if they want to as well. Um, but it's nice to start to bring people together. Mm. I think that for me is what's so important is actually people coming together. I have my own Facebook group actually as well for people if they want to kind of connect with other people mm. and myself. Um, so that's all on my website. Yeah, so I'll, I'll put that into the description so if people yeah. want to uh, connect, I'll put that yeah. in the box. Those things, yeah. But it's just starting the conversations, mm. I think. I think for people... I'm just thinking the first course that I did, I'm just remembering a, a woman and it was just so overwhelming to hear other people's stories. Mm. She just felt like she was going to be the only one who felt this way. Mm. And to suddenly go, I'm not, um, was so much healing. And I think that's why the group work's really important for me. And actually mixed gender, that is something that I want to offer as well because there's a lot done about single sex and actually on the last course that I ran I said to them I was thinking about doing a kind of single sex or just women and they were all like no because they said it is so helpful to be able to hear from the other perspective mm -hmm. to be able to understand what it was like for boys what it was like for girls because that helps us you know come together that's what they were deprived of lots of children mm -hmm. at school so actually learning how to relate in these groups is really important as well mm -hmm. yeah 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 thank you yeah great great well come we've probably been on for an hour now it does go quickly yeah. <laughs> um so i think i've asked most of the question or you've spoken about most of them i guess is there anything i mean you we've spoken a bit about the lack of safeguarding regarding sexual yeah. relationships I mean, anything else that you want to add in that you feel is important, you know, your message? Well, maybe there's something also that I... Um, there's a lot There's a lot in the press. Well, not a lot in the press, but, you know, there have been many articles in the press, but they're often written or they're often by men. So it's the men who are speaking up about the abuse in boarding schools. It's, mm. And the, the female voice isn't spoken. Mm. Um, there was abuse at our school. Yeah, yeah. Girls were abused in our boarding school. Mm. Um, and that isn't spoken about. There's this perception of, you know, it, it's just the men. It's just the boys that this happens to. Mm. Um, women have experienced so much abuse and trauma as a result of going to these schools as well and whether there's something about the female voice in general in our society it's much harder to speak out um, and I think that plays a part also in what's been spoken about in the press um, so people have a perception that it was easier for the girls um, than it was for the boys um, but it's there it's prevalent it was there um, so that's something that I think is really important to speak out about. Um, and then the other side of that message is also to say that part of my message is that everyone is affected by going to boarding school mm. in some way or another. That So a lot of the work that I've done on myself has been about, you know, I wasn't personally abused, but I grew up in an institution where there was prolific sexual abuse. Mm. That has had an impact on me and my development. You know, the fact that, you know, we can name the history teacher, English teacher, physics teacher, et cetera. Um, and therefore I grew up in an environment with that sexual energy. Mm. So I grew up with a fear of men and with male authority and how that shaped my perception of men. And I think for lots of people I can often hear, oh, well, 
it wasn't that bad for me going to school because I wasn't abused or I wasn't um it has had an impact it will have had an impact um and when it comes actually to I remember talking about this in my therapy once and because often that can be the question it's like if they hear that there was abuse at your school you can see people's mind thinking well did it happen to you mm. and I used to find that really hard because I'd feel like I have to go well no it didn't but then there was a part of me that wanted to say however mm. it has had an impact mm. because it has an impact on why wasn't I chosen why wasn't I special you don't realize that at that time that those children are the ones who are being chosen and taken off for those trips to France or those drinks on a Sunday evening why are they favored because as children you're deprived of that parental love and affection mm. so I noticed that I grew up um seeking that feeling of being special because I don't get it at school mm. um and I remember in, in my own counselling um, saying, oh, well, I've got no right to have any of these feelings. And I was saying, boarding school is like, it's the replacement for a family. It's like you're a family system. If one of the parents abuses one of the children, it has an impact on the other child in the family. Mm -hmm. And that I found a really helpful way of understanding, actually that if there's such a thing as abuse in your system, it affects everyone. Um, it really does in so many different ways. Yeah. And I think that's part of maybe my message mm. to just say, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate, I remember as a young boy at that school, uh, we used to have a phrase that backs the walls and the name of a teacher to stay away from them because otherwise they would likely sexually abuse you and it's like yeah to grow up in that mm. environment i mean that's not a safe place to uh, yeah. live um so and how it shapes your kind of yeah your relationship with authority figures with kind of mm. men you're older those kind of situations yeah, yeah, yeah. huge impact so that's kind of part of yeah the work yeah well, amazing work and it's yeah it's mm. great that you're doing this work and what's the chance of uh, likewise please. two people yeah. from our school uh doing... I know. or it's like is there a likelihood is there a reason for that also you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. but no it's great to, it's great to reconnect with you really good yeah likewise and please yeah. you know people please do uh get in touch with Amelia on her website if you want to join her groups or um yeah. you know find out about more about her work then then do and yeah really bless you for your work and you know if I can support you in any way please do let me know yeah all right okay See you soon yeah. all right bye-bye